This summer, I set out to ride my bike from my home in Washington, D.C. all the way to Washington State. My friend Tran joined me for the first day of the trip. I've done all my long tours with him, so it was going to be weird to travel without him. In Maryland, I was on the CNO Canal Trail. The CNO is like my home trail. I learned to tour here, and I've done plenty of overnight trips here. It's not the smoothest trail, but it's pretty, and it has a lot of history from when it was used as a canal shipping route. It's mostly rocky gravel, but the Western Maryland Rail Trail runs parallel, and it's beautiful and smooth. Of course, the Paw Paw Tunnel was closed, just as it was the last time I rode this section, so I had to push my bike up the mountain and around the tunnel. This section was 180 miles and ended in Cumberland, Maryland. In Cumberland, I picked up the Great Allegheny Pass Trail. It starts with a 20-mile climb up to the Mason-Dixon Line, the border of Pennsylvania, and the Eastern Continental Divide. The Gap Trail is still my favorite trail of the trip. It's pretty, especially around Ohio Pile. There are fun tunnels and bridges, and heading west, it's all downhill after the Continental Divide. The route I followed at the beginning of my trip was called the Eastern Express Route and ran from Washington, D.C. to Walden, Colorado. I picked that route because I liked the idea of starting the trip from home, and I didn't want to deal with shipping my bike or getting a ride to Yorktown, Virginia to join the adventure cycling Trans Am route. I also appreciated the shorter mileage and the fact that I could avoid Kentucky with all the complaints of wild dogs chasing cyclists. The trail ends in Pittsburgh, where I had some friends to stay with, and the Panhandle Trail takes you through the rest of the state. I wasn't in West Virginia very long, just hit the far outside edge with the dystopian looking power plant and a glimpse at the agricultural infrastructure that will dominate my trip for the next few weeks. Getting into Ohio was kind of scary. I was really into the unknown by that point. It was further west than I had ever ridden before. I didn't have anywhere arranged to stay and I had to start planning one day at a time. It was one of the hardest states too because I passed through during a heat wave. It's also the first place I encountered a thunderstorm that required me to duck into the first available shelter. In this case, a creepy abandoned barn. The story of Indiana is headwinds. That plus the heat wave made for some really hard days. Heading into Indianapolis was one of the toughest 55 mile sections of the trip with 100 degree temperatures high humidity, and strong headwinds. At least I had a friend's house to stay in when I got there. Into Illinois. This covered bridge was probably my favorite part of the state. The road construction was not my favorite though. I was not gonna detour around the construction, so I had to push and carry my bike over some sketchy bridge sections, sometimes where I could see the water 30 feet below me as I shimmied over a narrow passageway. I crossed the Mississippi River as I entered Missouri, which felt like the first real accomplishment of the trip. I also picked up the Katy Trail, which I had been looking forward to since the start of the trip. St. Charles is the first town on the trail, and it's where Lewis and Clark launched their expedition. The Katy Trail is another rail trail, smooth, relatively flat, and with decent bike infrastructure along the way, like the Turner Katy Shelter. It has some nice covered bridges and a view of the Missouri River the whole way. Now I was on the path of Lewis and Clark, who were coincidentally also headed to Washington State.
Western Missouri wasn't my favorite. It was hot, hilly, and I was back in farm country. Kansas was a state I had been dreading since the beginning of the trip. I thought it was just going to be flat, boring cornfields for days. It was not flat. It was also super windy. Windmills are always a bad sign, and the crosswinds were intense. It was exhausting to lean into the wind the whole time I was riding. But now I was on the route of the Pony Express. Trees were starting to become more scarce, so I had to find shady rest spots wherever I could. At least the state was less boring than I had expected. Early on in the trip, I zoomed out on the map a couple times and freaked out about how much further I still had to go. After that, I never zoomed out again until I was close to the end. When I approached the geographic center of the US, I couldn't even look at the map. Instead, I filmed this sign that didn't include a map. The route between Kansas and Nebraska was really pretty. It's where the song Home on the Range was written. I went through there while the road was under construction, so I had it all to myself. But this is also where I broke a spoke. I actually liked Nebraska. It was easy, it was pretty in a kind of corn farming way. I had tailwinds for once, and I was able to ride some of my highest mileage days of the trip, including an easy 85 mile day. I got through the state a day faster than I thought I would, even stopping to get my spoke fixed, or so I thought. Unfortunately, the repair shop fixed my spoke, but messed up my tubeless setup. For some reason, the roads of western Nebraska were lined with wild marijuana plants. I never figured out why it was so widespread and the locals didn't know either. In western Nebraska, I experienced my first flat tire of the trip. Thankfully, I met the Stroke Onward group, riding across the country in the opposite direction, and they were able to help me temporarily fix my tire. I thought the cornfields would end the minute I entered Colorado. They kind of did, but they were replaced by wind and nothingness. I had high hopes for Colorado. I was expecting better food, more liberal politics. Instead, Eastern Colorado was still really Trumpy and just barren, so flat I could see for miles. There were times I actually had to stop to appreciate the vast views. In Colorado, I was still dealing with the fallout from getting my spoke fixed in Nebraska. I had to run a tube in my back wheel because my tubeless setup was broken and my tubes kept getting flats. In one of the most desolate sections of the whole trip, Pawnee National Grassland, I had to duck into an abandoned barn 
to wait out a thunderstorm while trying to fix another flat. It didn't work, and I ended up having to push my bike to the next campsite. In Fort Collins, I got my tube fixed, took my first day off of the trip, and visited some friends in Boulder. From there, I entered Poudre Canyon, which was one of the prettiest sections of the trip. It was really exciting to see the mountains, water, and something other than corn. Poudre Canyon was one big climb, and it ended with the highest elevation of the trip, Cameron Pass, at 10,276 feet. When I got to Walden, I hit the Adventure Cycling Trans Am, which is the most popular cross-country bike route in America. It was first pioneered during the 1976 bike centennial and continues to be maintained by the Adventure Cycling Association. I was glad to finally see more bike tourists. Before that, I sometimes felt like I was the only person on a bike in the entire country. soon hit one of the craziest sections of the trip, where cyclists need to ride on I-80 for 12 miles. There were insane headwinds when I got there, so I stopped to take a break at a gas station. The headwinds never died down, so I just went for it. Luckily there was a good shoulder. I was exhausted after that, and tried to sleep at the first place on the map, the Walmart parking lot where winds ripped out my tent stakes and I could barely sleep. That was a rough night. After that, I really liked Wyoming, even though it felt like being on another planet at times. Wyoming has a lower population than DC, and it really shows. It was just barren landscapes for as far as you could see, populated only by cows. But it was really pretty, and I enjoyed riding there. I also enjoyed some of the more unique accommodations, like this cyclist hostel in the basement of a church where everyone could sign their name on the walls. The heat became a bit more bearable because there was less humidity I heard people say that biking in the west is easier than in the east, and I think they're right, mostly because of the lower humidity. By this point, I was starting to feel good about my chances of making it to Washington State. Earlier in the trip, I was unsure of whether or not I could make it that far. The Wind River was really beautiful, and surprisingly, mosquitoes were worse than ever. I gave away my bug spray in Missouri, thinking there would be no mosquitoes out west, but I was wrong. 
They were worse than anything I experienced east of the Mississippi. When I crossed Togwoody Pass, I tried to get a shot of the sign, but I was just getting destroyed by mosquitoes. I toughed it out long enough to get one shot. After the pass, I saw the Tetons, which was an awe-inspiring sight. I still had some scary moments with storms, but I got to a post office just in time to take cover. Grand Teton National Park was great, but the road through there to Yellowstone was not. There was no shoulder, and I was getting passed by RVs constantly, within inches of my body. It was hard to enjoy the scenery while that was happening. In Yellowstone, I met a few other people to ride with, like Ben and Vlad. My new friend Ben was arguing that we should only do 30 miles that day so we could spend some time sightseeing. I wanted to do 50, but I told him we could do less miles if I saw a bison. Sure enough I saw one, but the sightseeing didn't take long, so we did 50 miles anyway. Of course I had to stop and see the geysers, including Old Faithful and the others nearby, as well as the prismatic springs, which were incredible. After leaving Yellowstone, I entered Montana. This is actually the view from my campsite, which was one of the prettiest of the trip. Afterwards, I rode past Earthquake Lake, which was the site of a huge earthquake and landslide. It was interesting reading the history of it, but I couldn't stop long because the mosquitoes were feasting on me while I tried to read the roadside history signs. Montana was the state with the most varied scenery of the trip, and it was beautiful. I passed through some ghost towns that had been revitalized to attract tourists. They left half the buildings as is and converted half to more modern buildings. I also hit some insane winds in Montana. At one point, a whole group of bike tourists were stuck in Twin Bridges, Montana, because there were 25 mile per hour sustained headwinds into Dillon. My friend Ben and I decided to go for it because the weather app said the winds would shift. The other bike tourists said we were crazy or stupid and that we'd be back in 15 minutes. But sure enough, the winds shifted and we had an easy 25 mile ride. Easy except the wildfire smoke. I had to wear a mask at times while riding. After that, I got to Big Hole Pass. 
It was called that because the topography was like a big bowl. The shape of the bowl held in all the water and was a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. Wisdom, Montana had the worst mosquitoes of anywhere on the trip. Ben and I spent an evening hiding out in a campground bathroom to avoid the mosquitoes and then got out of there as quickly as possible. Soon after that, I rode into Missoula, stayed with an old friend, and visited the headquarters of the Adventure Cycling Association, a must stop for anybody passing through. They had a lot of historic bikes on display. They gave us a tour, including free ice cream and soda. They also take pictures of all the bike tourists who stop by, so I got my picture on the wall. I didn't do any research into Idaho before my trip because it seemed far-fetched that I would even make it that far. The state border was at the top of Lolo Pass, which was a big climb, but it led to one of the best downhills of the trip, 3,000 feet of beautiful winding descent. The route was dotted with hot springs, so I got to camp next to this one and go in at night and first thing in the morning. Idaho also had more trees than I had seen in a long time, so that was a welcome relief. My route paralleled rivers throughout the state, so the views were just incredible the whole time, and I could dunk my feet in whenever I wanted to. Finally, I made it to Washington State. My goal for the whole trip was to get to Washington State, but I didn't have a plan once I got there. It turns out the eastern part of the state is a big empty desert, and I got there right at the start of another heat wave. If I had kept going, it would have meant riding through 110 degree heat with nowhere to stop and get water. At that point, I had accomplished my goal and really didn't feel like dying of dehydration, so I stopped biking. Overall, it was an incredible experience, and one I'd like to do again someday, but not anytime soon.